Uh, this is Bill Schultz, historical writer at the Medical College of Wisconsin, and joining me today is Dr. William Schneider, class of 1960. Bill, thanks so much for joining me. Happy to be here. Well, let's get started. And I'm going to learn some things, I bet, that I didn't even know, which is always fun. I hope it's okay. <laughs> no, it'll, it'll be fine. Repeatable, anyway. It'll be repeatable. Tell me about your background. Where are you from? Uh, I'm raised in, uh, in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Actually raised out in Greendale. And we moved uh, in 1948 to uh, Greenfield and attended Pius High School. Uh, was interested in pre-med. Applied to pre-med at Marquette. And Spent three years in Marquette and pre-med. Okay. And then uh, leaned on Mary Casey forever and ever and ever, Bessie Casey forever and ever, you know, and we always said it was Bessie that got us into medical school. I have heard that, heard that many times. Half of, half of the interviews I've done. <laughs> right. She was now, a wonderful lady. She was, uh, I would have loved to have met her because everybody from Mike Bolger up and down the line, all the alumni that, that got Bessie. in, they say it was her. Bessie Casey. Now, let me ask you a question. When in your life, sometime grade school, high school, when did you, the light go on and, and it said, Bill, you need to be a doctor? I think it was a gradual thing. I was always impressed with God's creation of life. Uh, we'd go hunting and my dad saying, hey, Billy, clean up, the, clean up the rabbits, let's get going, you know. I'd be sitting there and I'd be dissecting the rabbits. Gee, this is the heart, this is the GI tract. I just was so impressed. This is a liver, you know, and I just enjoyed that all the time. Whatever animal that we would uh, shoot, whenever we were hunting, I'd always want to see how it worked inside. I always had um, empathy, I think, for people that I think were less fortunate than we. We were not super fortunate people coming out of the Depression. But uh, when I'd see people, handicapped people, cerebral palsy kids, I always thought, God, you know, I really feel bad about that. And if I could help somebody like that, I would be very happy. And I think this is what the idea of, uh, of being a healer, I think, uh, really, really is what got me interested in medicine. While at Marquette, uh, okay, and you undergrad at Marquette. Right. And, the, the, you know, my question is, d did you, was it just, I'm at Marquette undergrad, I'm going to go to Marquette University School of Medicine, or did you apply elsewhere, too? No, what happened is, uh, well, first of all, I wanted to go to Marquette, okay? Um, I was out for track the first year. Buzz Schimmick, you know, I just would run us ragged, and I decided I didn't want to do that for four years. I thought maybe I'd study real hard and try to get into medical school in three years. So that's, at that time already, you know, I was, I was in, pre-med is what I was interested in. And once you're in medical school, uh, tell me about, you already mentioned Bessie Casey. Her name, like I said, has come up everyone from the, the time that she was the, the registrar have mentioned her name. Any other professors that, when you think back, that were very memorable, that, that left a, a, an interesting impression? Oh, I think they all were. We had, it was, a, it was just so interesting. Dr. Fox, Max Fox, taught us uh, neuroanatomy. At the greatest time in the world, had to turn off all the lights right after lunch. We'd have an hour of neuroanatomy and say, this is the corpus callosum, now, now, here's a substantia nigra and all these things. And half of us would be dozing, we couldn't stay awake, you know. And he was so intense. Oh, Benjamin, Dr. Yeah. Benjamin in, in anatomy. Yeah. And uh, on and on, you know, yeah. Walter Zeit. Walter was an interesting guy when he wasn't playing pinochle. He was pretty good going around teaching us anatomy. I've heard that Dr. Zeit would be in the cafeteria or the library or wherever it was playing <laughs> Cards with the, like cards with all the, the students. Time. Yeah, you know your um, uh, your specialty, orthopedic surgery. Uh, two things about that. When did you decide that uh, this was the specialty for you? I was impressed with uh, Walter Blount as a teacher. Uh, th he was a great teacher in the sense that uh, it was hands-on, and I had the experience of being involved in the last polio epidemic at Children's mm -hmm. Hospital. And he would sit down and show us, this is how you've got to understand your anatomy. This is how you've got to examine a patient. You know, we didn't have a lot of exotic things to work with. You can't do an MRI of a polio patient. You have to really examine them and know what you can do. And can you transfer this muscle? Can you not? That always intrigued me. 
Was but this my, while you were finishing up? This is your, a, this is while I was a medical a medical school. student. Yes. That was very impressed to me. That. My problem was that when I was on OB, I was going to be an OB man. When I was on surgery, I was going to be a surgeon. When I was in pediatrics, I'm going to be a pediatrician. And I finally thought I'd probably be an internist. Mm -hmm. uh, I had, had uh, as a senior student, uh, I had a great exposure at, at County Hospital with orthopedics. Al Critter, Charlie mm -hmm. Desch, great guys. Yep. And they would yep. let me pin hips as a senior student wow. and do all the fractures, Collie's fractures and all these things. They really wanted me to get into it. And I'd say, yeah, guys, but I think I'm going to be an internist. Then I went in service. I was in service for three years. So you, we were, when we you were finished in medical school, yeah, we were in the last okay. of the drafts, the the, the uh, medical school draft, the medical draft at the end of the Berlin crisis. Mm -hmm. So our choice was either to go in, for, you know, go in now, or go into a berry plan. Yep. And after a residency, well, at the time I finished a residency, I'd want to go out and practice. Mm -hmm. So I did that first. Then I, uh, in service, I was, was interested in. In medicine again. Where were you stationed? I was stationed in Loring, Maine, oh. in SAC. And I was attached, uh, Curtis LeMay thought that, uh, because they, they sent me to the aerospace school, first of all, uh, and they thought we should be flying with the crews. Mm. So I, had, I was flying chrome domes, 34 hour chrome domes, mm. uh, in B 52s. In fact, I was on a one way trip to, to Russia at the time of the uh, Cuban crisis. Oh, wow. That's something I'll always remember. Did they Turn around, or did you? They, they turned us around at the last yeah. moment, but we were ready, to, really ready mm -hmm. to go. It was a real thing. So, but then uh, I got a couple calls from uh, w actually Walter Blount said, "If you have time, come back, children's." And uh, you know, when you, when you have your two weeks off in service, so I went back and, and did that, and and spent time with him, and, and he said, "You've got a spot here mm -hmm. if you w come out of service." And I thought, you know. I can do children's orthopedics, I can do adult orthopedics, I can do uh, treat the elderly. It has a full gamut of, of range. And I love working with my hands, I'm a carpenter. I was a mason for six, for six years in pre-med, laying brick, you know, and I love to build things and do things with my hands. I thought, this, I'll really be happy doing this. And I really was, it was a great choice for me. Well, you mentioned Al Critter, who I, I knew Al, and uh, you mentioned Walter Blount, who I never met. Any during your residency, any other uh, Al mentors? Schmidt. Al Schmidt was a great mentor. Mm -hmm. uh, Bruce Brewer was a great yeah. mentor. And uh, it, the difference then, in, when we got into that program, into the Milwaukee Orthopedic Program, uh, we really, really worked. It was 36 hours on, four, 12 off. 36 on, 12 off. But we really had experience. Mm -hmm. When you're at Children's Hospital, as a senior resident at Children's Hospital, we did all the surgery. And, you know, Walter Blount would sit there and, and watch us do his cases for him. Uh, Al Schmidt would do that. Bruce Brewer would do that. And we could do like 20, 25 cases a week. We had experience that was incredible to the point that when you finished, you felt, I have to go someplace where I'm really needed, mm -hmm. where I can fulfill a spot where there is a need for an orthopedist. Well, the, the, the group of orthopedic surgeons over the decades uh, has got to be one of our most lo loyal group we have within our alumni body. The, you finished your residency in 67? In 67. 67. Came to Green Bay in 67. Yeah, well, I was going to ask you, you're, you're a Milwaukee kid. Yeah. You went to Marquette. You had the service. What brought you up here? I think what brought me up, well, first of all, it looked like I was going to stay at Children's Hospital. They wanted, you know, I was being trying to be coaxed to stay at Children's and, and go into academic medicine. Well, you told me one time that yeah. your, your love of teaching, right. that you would... Absolutely, and, I, yeah. and that was very, very tempting. But, uh, you know, uh, we, we had a s kind of an unforeseen thing. Uh, Sandy, my wife, uh, was a uh, bacteriologist and worked at, at the um, TV sanitarium on county grounds. And they had an explosion in the lab, and she developed a pneumonitis. Mm. And we thought they thought she just had this is before we were, the year before we were married. Thought she just had pneumonia. Well, then we were in service and came back out of service, started the residency, and by gosh, she started coughing up blood, and she had full-blown uh, tuberculosis. Mm. So she ended up in tuberculosis sanitarium. I had four children at the time, four little kids, and. Uh, 
I had gone through, past Muirdale so many times. <laughs> I lived at County Hospital yeah. for so long. Yeah. And then I, I had some great uh, fellows in general surgery that had gone to Green Bay. Uh, Bruce Stair was trained at the county, mm -hmm. a great surgeon. Bob Brault, great chest surgeon, trained at the county in our program. And they said, Bill, nobody's come to Green Bay in 17 years. Orthopedic? Yeah. Okay. You'll be the third orthopedic surgeon in town, op, you know, doing surgery. And uh, I said, you really need up there. So I got, I heard about that. And then somehow they, they talked about the Bureau of Handicapped Children. They said, you know, you can do children's orthopedics up there for the state. And we had a you know, volunteer clinic uh, mm -hmm. took care of all those cerebral palsy kids and hemophiliac children. And I, it was just so tempting. I said, hey, I'm going where I'm needed. Mm -hmm. And I told the people at, at Children's, I'll come back in two or three years. Just let me get some experience out and I'll come back. I won't be so inbred anymore because I've been there for yeah. how many years already? You know? Right. Well, when you're taking care of the good farmers and the good people, you just, you can't leave them, you know? No. You just can't leave them. So and I was, just said, hey, this is, this is where I was staying. Well, those two guys were the, the ones that were up here already. Right. You joined their practice. No, okay. no, no. They said, okay. they said, don't, just be independent so you can take, mm. so you're not involved with any clinics. So I started my own practice. I bought the x-ray machine on the Columbia Hospital when they were putting the new addition on. Took a loan from Kellogg Bank in Green mm -hmm. Bay. Uh, got an office started and uh, worked for a year by myself. And Dave Jones joined me later on, Tom right. Kempkin, fellows from our program, Ander Mark Anderson, McKenzie, and on and on we went. Right. But, but it was just a tremendous way to practice. Yeah, yeah it's a, it, that, the legacy of your practice is, is really something. And it was fun. Yeah, and it's still going on. It's still going on. Yeah, because uh, Mackenzie split off, but Dan Linehan uh, and others are, are still up here. It's yep. uh, right. just tremendous. The, uh, you know, your career up here, you know, and I, I know, I knew a little bit more about your beginnings and now, and knowing you after sort of your later in your, your, your years with your practice. But the, the practice itself, you, you grew it, you added, you know, MCW alumni, Marquette alumni to the practice. Uh, during your career, I mean, can you, you know, any, you know, highlights that just really jump out at you? Uh, I mean, I'm probably so many that it's tough to narrow it down to one or two, but anything jump out at you, uh, you know, other than building the practice? Oh, I think the, um, I think it all goes back to uh, the program in Milwaukee that we had with Walter Bond. Walter would uh, tell us, hey, you know, I'm a scoliosis man. He, built the Milwaukee Brace with Al Schmidt, made that world famous. He was not doing spinal surgery the way fellows like John Hall was in Toronto, who was one of the top orthopedists, you know, children's orthopedists in Toronto for spine surgery. Uh, he was not doing congenital hips like Bob Salter was. So he would take us and say, Bill, go up there and spend some time in hospital for sick children. Go up there and do that, you know. Uh, sent me down to Adrian Flat to learn how to do hand, children's hand surgery at Iowa City. He was, Walter was so, uh, such a good person and his pride never overcame him. He'd say, hey, this person knows more about this than I do. I want you to learn how to do that. So when we were up there, when I went up there, we did all the scoliosis for northeastern Wisconsin. The, the joys that I would, and what I would experience was the fact that I could go ahead and um, meet somebody in a, in a grocery store or something say, Dr. Schneider, do you remember me? You fused my spine. I had a double curve scoliosis mm -hmm. when I was 14 years old, wow. 15 years old, 16 years old. You took care of me. I now had three kids and I have had a good life. Great. Yeah. You probably, you know, I mean, you're probably still The rewards, running. you're running to people. Yeah. With, you know, and then, we, then because Walter was so involved with osteotomies of the hip, he, we had to learn how to do cup arthroplasties outside of Milwaukee. We got, when, when Total Hips came, we, we, we were the forerunners in, in the state doing Total Hips and things. Well, I, I have a question. I mean, you, you, you know, you're an experienced orthopedic surgeon. <clears throat> new things are coming along. Did you learn these new procedures by going to the places where the people were developing them? Is that how you learn those new procedures 
after you'd already finished your training? Well, you'd, well when, for example, when methylmethacolate came out, when Charlie was first doing that in the, oh God, that was early 60s, early 70s, he had to learn how to use the cement. So we had to go, I think we went to, I went to Philadelphia here doing total, using a lot of cement there. We learned how to mix it, how to use it. How to, but the point was we, we did a lot of innovative things ourselves. For example, everybody's doing the hip through the anterior approach. But well, we had learned to do things through the posterior approach. I thought it was a safer way of doing it, mm -hmm. less blood loss. Uh, I did cavarthroplasty through the posterior approach. When total hips came out, we said, hey, let's go ahead and, and uh, do it through the posterior approach. Mm -hmm. So then when we got going with the, um, we were, I was involved with the Hip and Knee Society of the United States. But well, we started giving lectures, mm -hmm. you know, I was actively involved in that. That was the greatest thing in the world, to yeah. go ahead and, and follow your patients, present a paper to your colleagues around the United States, and say, this is how we're doing it. And then they would do the same thing to us, rather than reading about it in a, in a journal three years later. And this is what kept us up on, uh, you know, yeah. up to snuff. That's great. A lot of, I mean, it's a uh, very collegiality uh, within. So we made, we actually made movies on different mm -hmm. things, made movies on union you know, unicompartmental knees that we were doing at the time that surgeons could use around the country. We, and we always were, I think we kept that old academic thing going from, from Milwaukee. Well, that was instilled in us and that was just great. We were told to be, you know, teachers. Well, you, I, I know you've got a great love of teaching. You're also, you're a lifelong learner. Um, I, and I don't even know the exact year. What was your year that you retired from practice? 1995. Okay, so in about about 20 years. Right. And uh, the, but you you did. I mean, you retired from your practice, but with that love of teaching, I know you've you've taught for years. I know you teach yes. at the and still do at the Bellin College of yeah. Nursing. That, well, I don't do that as much now, but I'm very much involved teaching here now. I know that, yeah. and uh, uh, I mean, you were easily one of the uh, the first alumni from Northeast Wisconsin that, you know, took a flying jump onto the bandwagon because you, you, you thought this was great from day one. It was. Yeah. And, Absolutely. Uh, and, uh, you know, you're getting, uh, are, are you coming, what are you, what are you teaching over here? Well, this afternoon now, for example, the, um, later in the day, mm -hmm. I'll, I'll be in the anatomy lab. Okay. And they're doing, the, they're dissecting the hand today. Oh, super. And then I'll come in at, at four o'clock from four to five and, and, and t give them clinical ex ideas of what they're going to see in family practice, yeah. what their common anomalies are going to be, you know, what tendons are going to be involved with, what kind of injuries they might see, uh, all the common things of the hand. And just to uh, give them a clinical aspect, for example, when we had our anatomy, we didn't, s okay, so we learned anatomy as, as M1s, eh? Mm -hmm. And then you had M2s, we never, worried that much about because now you're taking microbiology, physiology, and everything else. And then you're starting your clinical experience, tail end of the second year and then to your third year. Then you start seeing a hand. Right. Gee, I'm going to say, oh, that's right, now this is the palmaris longest, I guess that's right. You know, and, and you start all over this way where the students are totally immersed. They learn why they're learning from a clinical standpoint. This is going to help me in practice. I mean, you began your practice up here in the late the late '60s. You and you told me one time. You, I mean, all these years up up, you're, you were you were you were teaching while you were up here. Right. And was that mostly at the Bellin College of Nursing? Bellin College of Nursing. Right. And, and were you doing you know anatomy? But no. What we would do is I'd I'd have them in the office with me, mm -hmm. and then I had the, the girls come into surgery and, and watch our surgery, and just to keep them stimulated, so they could see really. I thought if they could see what a total hip operation was like or a spinal operation was like, then they they could be much better, get much better care for that patient post-op. Yeah. And I think we made, you know, it helped the nurses a great deal. Yeah. And well, I just enjoyed enjoyed doing that. And then actually I was involved then with, with the, the Bellin School, uh, uh, put on uh, two or three day programs for nurses around the Midwest and from other universities. And uh, I was on the faculty and I would give a series of lectures on different things mm -hmm. that they wanted me to give lectures for. 
from an orthopedic nursing standpoint. I'll bet you you were a popular instructor, too. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I bet you were. You know, I wanted to ask you one thing, jumping back to your practice. I'm, I'm just curious. Was your, um, obviously, a, a later partner, Mackenzie, very involved with the Packers, were you and Dave and Tom and, and others also involved with the Packers over the years? You no, know, at that time, Jim Nellen was doing it. Okay. And uh, Jim Nellen took care of the, of the uh, players. I always ended up taking care of the coaches. Okay. I don't know how that happened, but I'd you know, be doing total hip surgery for different of the different coaches, different yeah. even with with um, basketball people too. Right. It was very interesting. I, somehow the coaches came to me, the players. You know, Jim Nellen, that was his job until he retired. And, and then McKenzie took McKenzie over. McKenzie took over. Yeah. Then. I was just a little while ago talking to uh, John Brusky, and I, I know his uncle was the the team general practitioner, general practitioner for years yeah. and yeah it's, a, it's just a you know certainly that's a big part of this community up here uh, the other thing I wanted to, to ask you about was uh, you know we talked uh, you know again we talked about this campus uh, you're getting involved teaching anatomy um, do you get, is, are those the that's when you get over here is to teach anatomy are, are you over here doing other things. Well, I'm teaching um, physical diagnosis of the extremities too. Okay. Of the cervical spine, of, of the uh, thoracic spine, of the upper extremities, the hips, pelvis, lower extremities. Wow, that's great. So, and those classes now for this class will start in October. Yeah. You know, the other thing, Bill, that uh, you know that I've had a chance to see, um, and you talked about working with your hands, and uh, but you're also a, a very accomplished artist. Um, I'm a painter. You decide whether it's well, artistic I, well, or not. I, hey, listen. No, I love watercolors. Well, it's interesting. I, uh, it's, it, it's happened because I used to draw all the time for my patients. Mm -hmm. I had a drawing board. Draw. In, it, I, I had a drawing board in each examining room, okay. and I'd say, "This is what your shoulder looks oh, like. Okay. This is what you have. Here's your fracture." Okay. Or if I do a total joint for you, this is what this is what we'll do. This is how this would look. This is how this will work. And I had uh, one of the fellows. He was a great, great artist, came down from uh, Dart County. He had a problem with one of his tendons. So I said, well, here, you're going to need some hand surgery. We can do that for you. Uh, here's what you have, and here's what it looked like. And he said, where'd you learn to draw? And this was back in 82. And I said, well, I just love to draw. I've never had an art lesson. But I said, uh, someday when I retire, I'm going to be a competitor of yours. I'm going to start doing watercolors like you're doing. He said, no, you're going to start right now. Yeah. And he got me involved that okay. year with the Peninsula Art School. And then I started. Uh, I started painting, and uh, it was just amazing. One thing led to another. Suddenly, I had the artists coming down, and I was taking care of them mm -hmm. from Dark County, and uh, it just it never ended after that. Gerhard Miller, I painted with yeah. Gerhard Miller Ger until he was 100 years old. Oh, I, I, I loved you know, uh, Phil Austin started the, the, um, the Transparent Watercolor yeah. Society of the United States. I painted with him almost every other week for a while, wow. when I had a couple hours off. And it, it, it just, it was just wonderful. I never had an art lesson, but I had an awful lot one-on-one -on -one time yeah, <laughs> with but, some good you know, people. It's, it's interesting. I, there are artists that are good artists, but then there's artists that the artistic ability, it's just part of them. It, they're natural. Uh, and, and that's what I see in, in you. And obviously that artist who you met saw that right away. And it's, it's neat. And, and I, again, I've seen your your view in your studio on uh, Sister Bay, and that's got to be inspirational yeah, it all is, by itself. It and you know, the um, Gerhard Miller was a bright, bright old fellow, and he said, you know, Bill, someday you won't be able to operate anymore. And he said, if you have to stop practicing medicine, it'll really be a change of life for you. Mm -hmm. However, if you keep painting, yeah. you'll just paint a little more. Yeah. Very clever. Well, he and that, that really, when I, you know, I, I stopped my practice, because of medical problems. I developed an autoimmune disease, mm -hmm. which we'll never go into now. And uh, they wiped out my immune system for three and a half years. And I, I really had to be careful how I, who I came in contact with and what yeah. I did. So I, I painted, and I painted, and that just saved me. Well, it's real tough to, uh, uh, having somewhat recently retired, I, I'm happy I have my fishing and my part-time job at the <laughs> medical college because I don't think I'd be real good just being retired. That's right. And, um, you know, but the, the, it's neat that you got to know Gerhard Miller. I went through the museum with Becky 
somewhat recently and, and looked at his work and he was a, a tremendous a artist. Just a tremendous yeah. artist. And that, that's so nice to have the gallery at the library. And we've painted together for 20 years. Oh. How yeah. neat is that? So I can't really say I never had an art lesson. Well, that really, you're, you know, when that you're, really is not. Uh, well, you're painting with masters, and yeah. uh, but no, that's that's wonderful, Bill. the The other thing that um, it's sort of interesting, and it's a little sidelight, and and you know, families, uh, you know, many of our alumni, uh, you know, have have you know, families are very important, and I, I still get a kick out of the fact that your your son John uh, is the general manager of the Seattle Seahawks. That's correct. Now I know he began with the Packers. Right. And then strayed and came back and but uh, that's got to be an interesting for a guy like you that's lived here and worked and worked with the coaches and now your son is the uh, general manager of of one of our, our arch nemesis. That's right. And it's not much fun to go to a game when the Seahawks play the Packers. You know, we have to uh, we're almost better off staying home than sitting yeah. in the box. But it's got to be fun for you. But it is fun. How many children do you have, you and Sandy? We have, have uh, six children. We have 19 grandchildren. Okay. And we, you know, we always, I always told the children, hey, you don't have to be a physician. If you want to be successful, find a, something that you really like doing. If you want to be the, a taxi cab driver, I used yeah. to tell my boys, if you want to drive a taxi in Green Bay, be the best one they ever had in Green Bay. But someday own the company. Yeah, there yeah. you go. And, uh, and John just had a passion for football. And I uh, was always trading cards, doing things, and uh, worked yeah, as well. You were an athlete, and John uh, John played football at absolutely. St. Thomas. St. Thomas. Right. Both our boys did at yeah. St. Thomas, and both of them were all state caliber okay. running backs. They were really good running backs. They got that from their mother, I think. Huh. Well, it's uh, it's a neat. It's neat. You've got. I know you've got a great family, and I've, I, you know, I know you and Sandy so well. I've not. I've seen. It's funny because I've, I've seen John on TV and games, and I'll. See, yeah, you know, I can see there. He looks kind of like Bill. Yeah. You know? But uh, no, that's great. You know, you've been, um, you know, very close to your your class of 1960, is a is a neat class. Um, uh, just a a big group of guys that have been super super active over the years, uh, and still are, like yourself and Joe Geenan, uh Bill Weber, and others. Uh, yeah. Tony uh, Zebert. What? Tony Zebert. Oh, Tony Zebert. I mean, I. Yeah. You know, and we all love Bob Tuhill and uh, right. and Keelan and uh, all started around our anatomy okay. class. You know? Okay, we had Cagle and yep. uh, Weber and Zebert and I on this poor cadaver that we were take, learning anatomy from, and uh, we've been friends for life. We were at each other's weddings. Yep. You know. Well, it's um, yeah, and I'm going to be with lunch and interviewing Bill Weber tomorrow. Uh, and uh, oh, we were really a group of guys. You know, you, you talk about having fun. I can remember Tony Zebert was uh, dating a girl from uh, St. Joe's a nur in nursing. Mm -hmm. And her dad was a very wealthy uh, sheep farmer in South Dakota. And uh, we would go on dates with uh, Zebert and myself and, you know, and the girlfriends and, and uh, Tom Cagle. And of course, I was, I was a, a mason. In sewer construction, I was building manholes, catch basins, and laying pipe uh, during the summertime. Tony Zebert was a garbage collector, garbage collector for um, for uh, didn't know that for uh, West Dallas, and of course Tom Cagle, his dad had Cagle in, and he was a bartender. Mm -hmm. So uh, he's his his daughter the uh, his daughter was going out with us, you know, during the summertime. And Dad wanted to know what kind of people he'd hang around with. She said, "Well, one guy's a sewer worker, one guy's a garbage collector, one guy's a bartender." And uh, <laughs> she told us her dad wrote a letter back. Can't you do any better than that for friends? You know, it's kind of fun. She didn't say that all of them were in medical no. school. No. Oh, jeez. <laughs> it was fun. Well, you're, it was, you're, we just had a great time together. Well, you well your classes. Uh, you know, I've had fun during my 20 plus years working with you guys on on all of your reunions. And the neat thing is that all of the, all the ones that you mentioned and a few more have been really active volunteers. And Mike and, Keelan. Yeah, Mike. One, and, you know, the, yeah. many have served on the alumni board, have hosted alumni events, guy help with the reunions, come to the reunions, uh, serve on the board of trustees. Uh, Bill Weber was president of the alumni association right. when we went from dues to no dues. You know, and and you've continued to be very active through the years, and now here at MCW Green Bay, what, you know, why have you? 
felt it's so important to stay involved with your, your medical alma mater? Well, I think that, you know, there's a difference between having an MD and being a physician. And I think we learn to be physicians down there. Mm -hmm. And, you know, but we didn't forget that MD part, which means, you know, to be a teacher. So we tried to be healers and tried to be teachers. And I think we owed that to the medical school, the way we were trained. I mean, I can remember, uh, I can remember uh, being a, a first month or two on clinical service. And uh, I'm trying to think who the internist was. One of the old stodgy internists came in. This lady was having a heart attack. And he walked in, held her hand and said, I'm Dr. So-and-so. You can relax now. Everything's going to be fine. That was like a quarter grain of morphine right there. We learned the art of medicine. And I think we all feel that we don't want that lost. Mm -hmm. You know, now you don't, you take a history of physical or do you order an MRI? Right. We don't want to see that happen. No. We want to see, be a physician now and forever, and then you become a specialist or a technician, whatever you want to do. You know what's happening, and it happens in many of my interviews, you're leading me right into my very next question, which was, since you graduated in 1960, You've, you're a perfect one to ask this question because you're still teaching medical students. What do you think are the big differences in education today compared to when you were going through your training? I think you've got to be very careful with the technology part of it and going back to becoming what is a real physician like? For example, I like to think that we are here, H-E-A-R, mm. for the patient. That's a great you know, one. we're here to listen. The, uh, they'll tell you, if you listen well enough, 95% of the time was wrong with them. The, physician, the patient is not here, H-E-R-E, -E, for you from 10 o'clock to 10, quarter to 11 or something like that. Yeah. You know, so I think that teaching to be a physician is important. Learn how to do a real history and physical without an MRI, without all these CT scans, without everything then order things that you really think you need to substantiate your diagnosis but don't go out on a witch hunt and order this and yeah. order that take the time to be a real physician I think that's what we wanted to see I think we they got a little bit away from that and and it, it bothers me a little bit that uh, that the physician that the surgeon no longer a lot of surgeons no longer do a history and physical uh, they have an internist do right. that for them so it it's a difference of uh, operating on a patient or operating for a patient. Yeah. And that's a big difference. Yeah, that's a good uh, And I think you have to try to ins instill, uh, the technology is so great. You can do an MRI, okay? But an MRI on the spine of a person who's 65 years old is kind of a historical compendium of their whole life. Mm -hmm. You know, how do you know that disc was, if you haven't seen it before, how do you know that's what the problem is? Right. If you haven't done the history and physical to corroborate what nerve is being involved. Yeah. So we're, I think the difference is technology is so much more in favor of, the, of taking care of the patient right now. But you don't want to have it be the be all and end right. all without being the physician who can sit down and listen and be a physician. That's great. You know, and that's why the, the students here are lucky to have someone like yeah. yourself helping them with that part of yeah. their education. That's great. Yeah.